Long dark winter, ladies and gentlemen, and by now you're probably feeling some seasonal depression. But hey, come on, cheer up. It can't be all that bad. You're watching Thumb Bandits, the antidote for SAD bastards everywhere. Sounded convincing to me, Alex. Get ready for a fun fest. This week we're popping our Xbox games cherry. Yep, we're bringing you an in-depth review of Halo. Is it the game that'll sell Microsoft's great black hope? First, it's just over a month before the UK gets their hands on the Xbox. The Americans have been lapping it up since last November, but we're still waiting. Everybody that is, except for me. Let me give you the vital stats. The Xbox will be launched on the 14th of March, and it will cost about £299. It will have between 10 and 15 games available to buy, with a further 90 or so in development. It's got four controller ports, you can link up to 16 players at one time, it has Dolby 5.1 surround sound, and is broadband ready. It weighs a ton, and Microsoft have 1.5 million Xboxes planned for Europe in the first three months. And it looks... well... It looks like a radiator. Oh man, Xbox, let me have a go on it first. Ah! The Xbox most definitely comes from the land of huge cars and huge hairs because everything about it is huge. This huge box will probably take up half the space in your average Japanese living room. And look at the size of these controllers. They're huge. But don't worry about it, you small-handed people. They'll be releasing smaller ones later on. Now let me get this straight. From now on, we'll be reviewing Xbox games before they come out, as well as PC and games for the PS2. And in the near future, we'll be reviewing stuff for the GameCube. These are very exciting times in the console world indeed. But what are the games like? Alex, you think you know it all, so tell us about the Xbox games then. Go on. Xbox understand the concept of killer apps. Hell, they invented the phrase. And the killerest app in a launch title of Xbox killer apps is the phenomenal, the all-inspiring, the all-encompassing Halo. Much of the action takes place on or around a stunning Ringworld-inspired planet. It feels like one of Ian M. Banks' culture novels come to life. You are a cyborg fighting on the side of the humans, defending your existence against the Covenant, an insidious, extremely intelligent, and deadly race of alien beings. And these bastards are as smart as human players, I kid you not. There are three different types of bad guys, from the small dog tweeny-like things, through the shield-toting middle management, up to the tall, lithe, terrifying baddies who when they panic, they run screaming right at your face, and they're not even the worst. All of them duck and dive and roll and hide and catch grenades and chuck them back at you, and group up and scream and run and learn. They are fucking smart. To protect you, you have a regenerative shield, which saves you from twattage until it's gone, at which point you can hide and rejuvenate. The ten awesome chapters of the game are played across areas littered with rocks, trees, crates, turrets, tanks, and hovercraft, all of which are interactive, and all of which are good places to disappear behind as your depleted energy returns. And what was that I said? Interactive? You can drive! Or, if you don't want to, you can man the guns on the vehicles instead! The nature of the game is team-based, whether you're playing with another human being in multiplayer cooperative mode or in single player with your artificially intelligent marine allies. And because there's so darn much shooting going on, you can expect a hell of a lot of friendly fire. It's a crash course in the madness of combat. If you do end up felling most of your comrades, there will be tears, there will be agonized shouts, there will be more weapons for you to collect. But. You won't have these very talented dudes around to save your ass when you're next hemmed in by the inevitable bunch of alien bad guys around the corner. Keep your head down, there's two of us in here now, remember? I had to stop writing this review three times in order to pick up and play Halo again because just writing about it reminded me of how beautiful, how exquisite, how outrageously sublime Halo actually is. Any attempt to be critical falls by the wayside. Halo defies derision. It is glorious happiness in one stunning DVD. This is the news. First of all, let me state categorically the PS2 fight back has begun. 
Telewest and BT Open World are leading the way as they test out the latest PS2 online technology. A few lucky people in the UK are already trying out their Telewest broadband network, playing multiplayer games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, and BT Open World are not far off their public trials. Sony's big idea is to establish easy, plug-in-and-play, stable multiplayer gaming for PlayStation 2 owners from around the globe. And they also hope to introduce other benefits that we've never seen before, like downloadable games. It looks like they're picking up from where the Dreamcast left off. And you'll be able to arrange to meet players at a certain time, or select a player from the list, and play in leagues, ladders, and of course have chat about gnarly skateboards, dude. If all goes well with their online trials, we can expect to see the PlayStation 2 go online by the end of the year. Now, some good news for deluded military fanaticists everywhere. Former SAS man Andy McNabb has signed a deal with Rage to produce a series of 3D military games primarily for the PS2 and the Xbox. However, the first one won't be out until 2003. Who knows if the Andy McNabb will actually be making an appearance as the star of the show or if he'll be lurking in the shadows, but do expect a Metal Gear Solid meets James Bond style of game that will have the boys wetting their pants. Now, it would be cheap of me to mention the words Lara and Ride in the same sentence, so I'm not going to bother. But at Paramount Parks, they're taking Tomb Raider to the next level of interactive entertainment with a fantastic ride at Paramount's Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio, America. The exact method of transportation has not yet been disclosed, but apparently it will be the first of its kind in the world. You will rocket up into ice caves, plunge into lava, journey into an ancient temple where stone walls give way, and thrill-seeking writers will also encounter a series of tombs and raid them. It's just like being in the game. Unlike the game, you won't be able to crawl behind Lara in dark tunnels or shoot people in the face if they get on your nerves. But Tomb Raider the Ride opens its doors on April the 6th. And finally, we are witnessing a terrible day in gaming history. Britain's number one boy band are launching their first game. Westlife Phenomania is coming to your PCs and your Playstations. The animated hostess Tara has okay. done her best to bring you the band's virtual lives, but Shane, Brian, Kian, Mark and Nikki will not, will not top the game charts. No. Here are a few things I think you should know about me before I continue this review. Firstly, I do have a girlfriend. Yes, I do talk to real people. And no, I can't stand real ale. Battle Realms on the PC is the latest in a long line of real-time strategy games, but deserves more than to simply be considered a sub-command and conquer clone. Although you'll recognize the formula of building armies and attacking, this does it with a unique style. But here's the mystery. I genuinely love strat games, especially online. Incredible. I have become everything I hate. Firstly, it's set in feudal Japan, and already it sounds brilliant. As Kenji, you have to make a choice early on whether to help those crazy peasants or join an evil clan. Then it's a case of slowly taking over the whole island using the super samurai you create in your dojos. What initially separates this from a lot of rubbish strat games, not are the fantastic graphics. Now, all too often they're overlooked in this type of game, but you have to admire the amount of work and attention that's gone into every individual character here. I'm not saying I particularly care about them, but some of those little fellas are really cute. Oh, bless them. The controls are much easier to grasp than you'd expect. After a brief tutorial that is almost interesting, you'll have learned all you need to know. The chaps also have a bit of intelligence and won't just stand there like the school spanner getting the crap kicked out of them. They will fight back and defend themselves. And this may disappoint some of you because you don't have that much input into the fighting. They sort of do it all themselves. But get over it. It's just a game. With a great control panel, it's simple to toggle between any battles and your village, so you can keep an eye on all the lazy sods back home. Also, building is piss easy, as are most of the other necessary, yet slightly dull tasks. From a boring, technical, nerdy, strategic point of view, this game is quite a challenge. There's no point in just quickly building a sizable army and storming through the woods. You will die. Wait. Build your village. Give these people a chance. You owe them that much at least. Sounds, colours and details make this an enjoyable game, and it should prove a great introduction to the world of pipes and slippers. But Battle Realms won't be for a lot of hardcore strat heads. It's a bit light. If Command & Conquer is Metallica, then this is definitely Hanson. But hey, I love Hanson. I even saw him live at Wembley Arena once. Make of what you will. Battle Realms is out now for the PC.
Right, enough of your British retro fest. I don't care who Sir Clive Sinclair is. I never had a BBC Micro, and what the hell is an Amstrad? But gaming systems, on the other hand, now you're talking my language. The early 80s was a dark time for home gaming. It was generally assumed that video games consoles were a fad that would die out with Atari. Nintendo tentatively launched the Nintendo Entertainment System across the US and the UK in 1986. Could the NES do things the Atari couldn't? I mean, why should anyone buy a NES? Step forward a little Italian dude named Mario. In 1981, Nintendo Supremo Shigeru Miyamoto created a little arcade ditty called Donkey Kong. The protagonist was a squat carpenter racing to save his girlfriend from the big ape. He was later christened Mario due to his resemblance to Mario Sigali, the landlord who looked after Nintendo's American office. It's true. Oh, the bliss, the many hundreds of hours I spent trying to find all the secrets and hidden levels of the amazing, the spectacular, the side-scrolling Super Mario Brothers. There were new medical conditions associated with the new console, from blistered thumbs to severely sore wrists, dubbed Nintendonitis, and the Americans even blamed the NES for a 10% decrease in cardiovascular fitness. But Nintendo and Mario didn't have it all their own way. In a karmically familiar console battle, the NES, which I painfully admit was the worst console, had three whole months of being the only child before the new kid on the block, the Sega Master System, arrived. If the Sega machine had been a person, it would have worn thick spectacles and a duffel coat. It was a super smart machine with nearly twice the memory of the flashy NES. But where I grew up, Sega was always Pepsi to Nintendo's Coke. Nintendo had also brokered all the exclusive deals with all the best developers, leaving Sega with in-house dreams and the outcasts who smoked behind the bicycle shed. Despite this, Sega produced quality arcade conversions such as Space Harrier and Outrun, as well as a budget range of games, always popular with the British, retailing at £9.99, which compared to the NES's cheapest games at £29.99 was a steal. The Sega Master System eclipsed sales of the NES when it arrived here in the UK. So, there still remains a cultural gap the size of the Atlantic between myself and you people. Freaks. Sweaty shorts, thick PE teachers, and strong girls showing off? God, I hated team sports and I refused to play them. So, I'm not going to play them now. I'm going to leave that to the jury. What Alex is trying to say is that it's time for our jury to review their games, which this week are all based around team sports. First up, it's cricket. Ooh, 2002. Now, this is supposed to be the definitive cricket game of all time, with detailed stadiums, changeable weather, and night and day options. It's bound to please the cricket buffs, but will it please three Scottish console addicts? A cricket game on the PlayStation, is it your thing? As soon as the commentary came on, it's, hello, welcome to the cricket. Yeah, no, it's not my thing. A lot of the other sports games are all very fast and action-paced. Do you think this suffers because it is a really slow game? Well, I don't know, because golf, you know, golf games are quite slow-paced, mm. but I, st I quite enjoy a wee round That's of golf. That's a very good point, actually, yeah. And snooker, quite enjoy a game of snooker mm. as well. So, I, I think it's just the cricket. Do you think the controls were just too fiddly and too awkward? The controls weren't awkward, but there just wasn't enough to do. You can bat, you can bowl, you can field, you can automatic field if you like, but then again that takes away one third of the gameplay, of which there isn't much. Wow. If the game is anywhere near as boring as Paul's explanation of it, then I for one certainly don't want to play it. Is it something that would appeal to cricket fans? I would definitely think so, yes. I mean, you get to bat, you get to bowl, to field, all the things that the, cr the cricket fans would like. Your favourite part of the game, what is it? Uh, switching it off. Oh, harsh! Oh, gosh, uh, that must have hurt. Well, a pretty mixed response from our unconvinced jurors. They're not into a game that takes all day and has breaks for tea. How about a real American sport? NBA Live 2002 is the eighth in the best-selling series, and not surprisingly, it's a huge seller across the pond. You can hang out in the locker rooms, practice over 50 dunks, build your own dynasty in the all-new franchise mode, and even check out over 50 different styles of shoes. But is it a slam dunk or a sweaty armpit in the face? <laughs> All right, Scott, apparently the gameplay in this game is so good that you can actually feel yourself sweating at home. How did you feel when you were playing it? Well, I don't know about the sweat. Thank you. That's, that's much better. Um, but it's certainly very fast-paced and frantic. My thumb sweated, but that was about it, really. 
What are the players like? And notice I'm making that. Yeah, gesture. I was doing that a lot as well. The players are fantastic. The muscles, the tattoos, the outfits. And some of the players, when they're standing outside of the court ready to throw the ball in as well, you can see their eyes move. It's really detailed. Mm. How does all that extra niceness make it feel when you play the game? Well, when you play the game, it doesn't make that big a difference. But when you're watching the replays, it's like watching TV, it's like watching you on TV. It's fantastic. And finally, a football game. No, not that one. Another one, Pro Evolution Soccer, which for some reason has seen fit to drop the ISS. Hmm. This instalment of the award-winning series claims to be more advanced, more entertaining, and give you an even more realistic gaming experience than the others. With more special effects like rain, fireworks, smoke and confetti, and added freedom of player movement. But will it win the cup, or have to slope off for an early bath? He shoots! There are so many football games at the moment. Can you tell me specific differences between this and any of the other games on the market? Well, personally, I'm going to say something quite controversial, and it felt fairly similar to me, mm. but uh, apparently, I mean, this game is meant to be much smoother than the rest, and tactically, you're meant to be able to kind of double round players a lot better. That's a foul. Is this game better in multiplayer mode? I think you have to play it multiplayer to really enjoy it. Playing a single player, there's still a lot there, but multiplayer, it really mm. comes alive. Is this worth getting? This is the one you have to get. This is the definitive. Why is it the definitive? <laughs> um, not just because it has the names, which it does now, but because it's the most realistic, it's most like real football and real life, that men play. How many goals you got in one game? <laughs> one. <laughs> which, which isn't bad because it's hard pull, to pull, score. Pull. Yeah. Just leave it there. Sorry. And it's a goal! <laughs> Swivel on it. So there we go. This week's loser with no votes is cricket. Rubbish game in real life. Does it transfer so well? I can't say. In second place with one vote, it's basketball bouncing the ball around. And this week's winner is Pro Evolution Soccer, the soccer game. Are you a skinny, puny white boy from the English suburbs, a bit like me? Do you fancy pretending to be a big, tough black fella from the Bronx? Well, now you can, because Mike Tyson is making a comeback to the PlayStation with Mike Tyson Heavyweight Boxing. Developers Codemasters are boasting about their specially written facial damage graphics engine, which sounds deeply unpleasant, but is actually rather cool. You can go face to face with Tyson in third or first person views, can create your own boxes, or progress through fights in seven gaming modes. As you progress, more challenges and game features are unlocked in preparation to enter the ring with Tyson himself. And if you want to teach Mike Tyson a lesson for being such a rather naughty young man, then Heavyweight Boxing is out on the PS2 in April this year. No, oh, boxing is just pointless violence. Now, Reckless, that's violence with loads of points. Reckless is a high-speed mission-based racer set in Hong Kong. Players choose to play the Japanese Mafia or the anti-Yakuza. Whatever you choose, Reckless claims it's ultra-realistic, completely free-roaming, has interactive environments, unique missions, real-time car damage, instant replays, and action-packed gameplay. Or so it says in the tin. Mm-hmm. Due for release in the Xbox, quarter two, 2002. Thanks a lot, Alex. Keep digesting that, and I certainly will be keen to see what comes out. Thanks. Now, I've noticed that a lot of kids these days are wearing baseball caps, so I'm nearly 100% certain that All-Star Baseball is going to be a massive hit on the PS2. There are 30 major league teams and over 700 players with lifelike face textures for superb graphic detail. There's play-by-play -play analysis with commentary from some guy called Bob Brenly, who's probably famous in America, and all 30 major league baseball stadiums. What's really exciting is that there is an innovative 3D batting interface available, which actually puts a bat in your hand. No doubt about it, baby. Home run. But before we go, Ian and I are going to have a little bit of fun killing things on screen. When we've done that, you can visit our website at www.channel4.com slash thumbbandits. See ya. Oh, look at this, Duncan. <laughs> Now we'll get some fucking work done around here, young man. <laughs> Was that what you wanted? We got a bit confused. <laughs> ah, get away! Get give us a hug. No. Come on, give us a hug. Yeah, Someone give me a hug. Give me a hug, you fuckers.